Does the Bible teach that speaking in tongues have to be in a known earthly language? What it was in the scripture was known languages. Known languages that could be translated miraculously. They would speak a language they didn't know, and then somebody would give a translation of that language they didn't know. That was clearly what was going on in the book of Acts, and that's... So John MacArthur thinks that was clearly what was happening in the book of Acts. Is it really that clear that speaking in tongues have to be a known earthly language? One of the main criticisms of modern day speaking in tongues is that it sounds repetitive and it doesn't sound like an actual language. But does it have to be? Does the Bible really teach that speaking in tongues must be in a known earthly language? Today I'm going to answer that question. But before I get into some actual scripture, I want to illustrate the whole problem this way. I want to play a clip from my niece when she was five years old, first learning to use WhatsApp, and she would leave all of these crazy messages for my wife on WhatsApp, all of these voice messages. Check it out. If you see your brother standing by the road, just, just, just tell him happy birthday, happy birthday to you, bro. Yeah, I plan to play that when she turns 16. Okay, so question. Was that a song? I mean, it has a melody. It has words. Was it a great song? No. Not by any stretch of the imagination. Not a bad attempt for a five-year-old. But it's a song. What does a song need? It needs lyrics. It needs a melody. Now, what if somebody says... That's not a real song. That's not a genuine song because the melody doesn't match the melody of any known song that exists. Would that be a valid comment? Would that be a valid objection to that being a song? And I think no. And it's really the same issue with tongues. You hear people speaking in tongues which you think is gibberish and you say, well, that doesn't sound like a language. It sounds so repetitive. They're saying the same things over and over, right? So is that a valid objection? Let's look at some actual texts of scripture. There are five passages of scripture in the Bible that talk about tongues. Two of them are prescriptive. Three of them are descriptive. What on earth does that mean? Every text of scripture could be categorized as descriptive, meaning it describes an event that happens. It's like a narrative, like for example, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. That is a descriptive text because it's describing something that happened. Then there are prescriptive texts which teach you to do something. For example, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That is a prescriptive text. He's telling them what to do. Then, in Acts chapter 8, they were scattered all over the place preaching the gospel. That is a descriptive text describing what happened. Both of them are important. Both of them are given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But prescriptive texts are clearer. And we have to be careful not to generalize descriptive texts too much. For example, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist at the River Jordan, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What if someone says, Well, that is the true experience of baptism. If when you got water baptized, a dove didn't land on your shoulder and you didn't hear a voice from heaven, then your baptism wasn't genuine. The error there is trying to generalize a descriptive text a little too much. And that's what you find happening with tongues. There is one descriptive text that says they spoke in tongues and people understood the languages and they treat that as a prescription for how tongues are supposed to be. So let's look at it. Let's look at the three descriptive texts that talk about tongues. All of them are found in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, they spoke in tongues, 
they were filled with the Spirit, and they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance, and there were people there who understood the words that they were speaking. So on the day of Pentecost, there's absolutely no doubt that people understood the languages that they were speaking. That is clear. But then we get to other passages like Acts chapter 10 when Peter was preaching to Cornelius and while he was preaching the Holy Spirit was poured out on the family of Cornelius and they all spoke in tongues. But it was a closed group so there was nobody there to understand anything that was going on. Were they speaking a known language? We have no way of knowing. Same thing with Acts chapter 19. When Paul laid hands on the disciples who only knew the baptism of John, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Again, we can't generalize too much because nobody said that they understood what was happening. So in those two descriptive texts, it is not really clear whether they spoke in known languages or not. And I could tell you that in Acts chapter 10, if anybody had heard Cornelius speaking in tongues and they understood the language, Peter would have said that because after this incident, there was a tribunal where Peter had to answer for his actions. How are you preaching the gospel to Gentiles? And he said, well, I didn't think Gentiles could receive the Holy Spirit, but then I heard them speak in tongues. If there was anybody there who understood the tongues or the languages, believe me, Peter would have said that. Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 19 are not really clear on whether the tongues were were known languages or not. And there are two prescriptive texts that talk about speaking in tongues. The first one is Mark chapter 16, where Jesus simply said, they will speak in unknown tongues. These signs shall follow them who believe they will speak in unknown tongues. It doesn't really say it has to be known languages. Then 1 Corinthians 14, here's what Paul said. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. No one understands him. Why would Paul make such a blanket statement, no one understands him? So 1 Corinthians 14 seems to be suggesting that whatever tongues they were speaking was not something any human being could understand. They were only speaking mysteries to God. So there we have five passages of Scripture. One of them clearly describes an incident where people understood the languages that they spoke. One of them clearly teaches or prescribes that no one will understand you. And three of them are unclear. They don't really speak to the issue at all. So what do we do with that? Is that really clear evidence that the Bible says speaking in tongues have to be in a known earthly language? Suppose you were on a jury and there were five witnesses who took the stand and one witness said i saw the defendant commit the crime a second witness said i saw somebody else commit the crime and three witnesses said we didn't see nothing are you going to convict based on that the only thing that the bible actually prescribes when it comes to tongues is mark 16 they will speak with new tongues Acts chapter 2 verse 4, they spoke with other, other tongues. The only thing that the Bible prescribes is that when you speak in tongues, you're speaking in some language that you don't know, that you never learned. The only thing that the Bible actually prescribes is that the tongue that I speak be foreign to me. Maybe somebody else could understand it, maybe not. The, that's the only thing that the Bible actually prescribes. So is that overwhelming evidence that tongues has to be in a known earthly language? In my humble opinion, no. So how do we make sense of Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost? Was that a pattern for tongues everywhere else in the Bible? Or was that a one-time event? And I think it's very easy to show that that's a one-time event because there were certain things that happened on the day of Pentecost that were never repeated. For example, when they were filled with the Spirit, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Many people were filled with the Spirit since then, but there was no mighty rushing wind. There were cloven tongues as a fire that sat upon each one of them. That was never repeated. And then they spoke in tongues, and it turns out that their tongues were known languages. So isn't it possible that that was just a one-time event that was never repeated. And again, in my humble opinion, that is how I see it. 
It is just like how when Jesus was baptized, there were certain things that happened that were, that were never repeated. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove, there was a voice from heaven. But you can't make that a pattern for baptism everywhere. And you can't teach people in a baptism class that if, the, if a dove doesn't land on your shoulder, then you're not genuinely baptized. That would be overgeneralizing what was intended to be a descriptive event of a one-time event. So is it really clear that speaking in tongues has to be in a known earthly language? Well, the five texts that we look at paint a mixed picture, and I think it's fair to say that the Bible simply does not give a definitive answer to that question. And I am not comfortable making doctrine about something that the Bible doesn't definitively teach. And why, why is this even a big deal? Really, why is this a big deal? You, you know, why is it, does it matter to you so much that tongues must be in a known earthly language? And there are two reasons for that. One, it gives you an opportunity to bash charismatics because most cessationists cannot pick up the Bible and defend cessationism or argue that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. They can't do it. And most of them will appeal to church history. They will appeal to theology and they will appeal to the bad practices and the bad theology of fringe charismatic groups. The fact that these charismatics are speaking repetitive sounds that don't sound like an earthly language is an opportunity for them to bash charismatics. And they don't want to give that up. And two, they believe that speaking in tongues is for the purpose of preaching the gospel in foreign languages. And I already have another video that completely debunks that idea that's on your screen right now. So remember to like the video if you like it. If you don't like it, then of course, then don't like it. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you would like to see more things like that. Feel free to check out that other video if you haven't seen it. And there's a playlist as well of the other teachings in this series. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you and I will see you all next time.